Hi, everybody, and welcome to a unusual session of uh, AFP of Greater Cleveland's Giving USA presentation. Um, I, I think this is the first time we are not all in a ballroom or a meeting room somewhere doing this. So thank you all for joining us in a somewhat unusual time. Um, this is Matt Carter. I am the VP of, uh, of um, what am I the VP of? My goodness. I'm the VP of professional development for our chapter. Whatever you um, want to be today. <laughs> right. And, and I am happy to uh, present our panel, and I'm very thankful to Peter Fissinger, who is a longtime supporter of our chapter. Um, so I am going to turn this over to him. Um, for those of you who have done our AFP stuff before, you know he, or our uh, Giving USA stuff before, you know he does a great job. So I'm going to turn it over to him and our panel. So Peter, carry, carry away. Thank you, Matt. I want to thank you all for joining us today. I'm really sorry that we can't be together in person. This is one of my favorite events of the year to do, uh, being a native of Cleveland. And uh, we got some interesting information to share with you. And we have a great panel to have some discussion about the information. I'm going to introduce the panel after I present the, the data. Uh, but before I do, I just want to acknowledge that today is Juneteenth. Uh, on June 19th, 1865, Union General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas, and enforced Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. It took him a while to get there because there was a war going on. The uh, proclamation was actually made on January 1st of 1863. The 13th Amendment, which officially abolished slavery in the United States, didn't happen until December 6, 1865. But for many, many years, uh, the African-American community has looked to Juneteenth to be a celebratory day of uh, the end of slavery. And I thought we could just take a moment of silence to acknowledge that. Thank you. Let's get right into the information because we only have an hour today. Uh, some of you who are new to this meeting may wonder what is Giving USA? What we're going to share with you is 2019 contributions by both source and recipient type. We're going to talk about trends in giving. We're going to have some discussion about the very unusual circumstances in which we're operating today. Some might even wonder how does 2019 even matter anymore? In the six inter in intervening months, we've had the pandemic hit, and now we've had this very significant racial unrest as a result of the killing of George Floyd. We do think the data is relevant for many reasons, but we're going to talk also about what's going on today. We're going to do that during our panel discussion. Uh, you're going to see at the end of this presentation uh, a code that gives you 30% discount on any given USA materials. We encourage you to consider buying those and using them with your nonprofit organization, with your board. Anything you buy helps to support this research. I do want to acknowledge that uh, Campbell & Company is part of Giving Institute, which funds this research, and there are a number of collegial firms that help to support the research and acknowledge that I want to thank all those firms and any who might be participating in this meeting today. Thank you for your support of this important research. Charitable giving got almost to $450 billion last year, which is uh, an increase of 4.2% over the prior years. It is the, uh, the last three years comprise the three largest years of giving in the history of the Giving USA research that goes back to 1960. And although 2017 uh, inflation adjusted remains the highest year ever. Just want to remind you that giving is really driven by the economy in many ways. And personal income rose 4.4% last year. The GDP rose 4.1%. And the S&P 500 rose almost 29% yet last year. So we had a great atmosphere for good giving and great generosity last year. Let's look at how this giving breaks down. 69% of the giving came from individuals, 17% from foundations, 10% from bequests, and 5% from corporations. I always like to point out how important it is that nonprofit organizations build a strong and sustainable program of individual giving. So you can see in this slide, almost seven out of 10 dollars comes from individuals. 
In fact, about half of foundation giving is driven by individuals who have converted their giving over to family foundations or donor advised funds. And then we've got the 10% of requests. And if you add all that up, it's about 87% of all giving driven by individuals last year. I'd like to take a, a two year look at this uh, because sometimes it can be insightful. So this, this year giving went up 4.2%. We actually had a slight decrease in giving last year, which you'll also see in another graph coming up a little bit later. And this is unusual because we were in a fairly strong economy in 2007 or 2018 as well. However, we did have the tax cut job acts go into effect. And we think that that could have impacted giving. Uh, we do know that 64% fewer people itemized on their taxes and therefore wouldn't be, wouldn't have a charitable abduction available to them. Also, in the last quarter of that year, 2018, although the stock market did well overall, the last quarter was very slow, and we think that affected giving. You see that it affected individual giving, too. So over a two-year period, the increase is 2.3%. And foundations, 7% over two years. I was actually surprised that foundation giving didn't increase more during 2019 than 2.5%, given the very uh, robust economic environment. Very often, wealthy donors take advantage of a strong stock market and transfer funds into either their family foundation or a donor-advised fund, but we didn't see that as much as I would have expected. And then giving by bequests last year went up 9.6%, but a total of 9.8% over two years. Giving by bequest fluctuates. It really depends. You know, the needle can be moved significantly by high net worth people who have very large requests who, who pass away and whose estates are, are processed. I just do also want to remind you, though, that even though that's the case, any organization can, can build a, a bequest program. And I like to equate it to an exercise program. You got to work on it a little bit every day, every week. And over time, it can make a big difference in the mission of your organization. Corporate giving went up 13.4%. It's very uh, closely tied to pre-tax profits, which were extraordinarily strong during 2019. This slide shows trends, five-year trends, where the giving was distributed. And all I really want to point out to you here is that the top part of the bar is individual giving. It dropped from 82% in the 1980-84 uh, time slot to 70% in the 2015-19 time slot. Virtually all of that can be seen as transfer of giving from individuals to foundations, which was at 6%. If you look at the second highest number on the far left column and rose to 16% in the 2015-2019 timeframe, further underscoring how donors have been uh, it, it, transferring money into family foundations uh, and donor advised funds and foundations also have been building their assets and increasing the giving that they're able to do. Let's take a look at where all that uh, great generosity went. Giving uh, to religion was 29% last year, $128 billion. Education, 14%, $64 billion. Human services, almost $56 billion. These have been the top three destinations of giving for quite a long time. And then there are these other categories, such as grant-making foundations, health, public society benefit, which, is, uh, uh, which includes a number of different categories uh, of giving, including the United Ways and Jewish, Jewish Federations of the World and uh, for-profit donor-advised fund uh, gifts. Arts, culture, and humanities, 21.6%. Uh, or $21.6 billion, a great year for that sector. International affairs, almost $29 billion. Environment and animals, uh, $14 billion last year. So in looking at the two-year trend, I just want to make a few comments. Giving to religion has always been the most popular destination for philanthropy. It is, however, shrinking as a share of the total pie. And there's a lot of speculation about what actually is going on there. Some who are advocates for giving to religion and really involved in giving to religion believe that, that the data might be undercounting. And so I just want you to know that we've been 
advancing our research in that area. Also, even if that's true, there are a declining number of people who attend church every year, and, and that affects giving because they're asked to give every week. In any case, some wonder if this is the birthplace of giving and it could affect philanthropy going forward. I'd like to say that that's not the case, but it is an interesting dialogue to have. Giving to Education had a robust two-year as well as one-year uh, time frame. Uh, education is often the destination of very large gifts when the market is strong. Human services up 7%. I really think that the economy uh, had a lot to do with the jump from 2 to 5%. Uh, because, frankly, giving to human service tends to increase. Excuse me one second here. I pulled my earplugs out. Thank you. Giving to human service tends to even get stronger during uh, economic downturns. We're going to be interested to hear from Mary about that. Giving to found, uh, foundations, a two-year period, up 2.1%. And then when you look at health, arts, culture, and humanities, and environment, I'm picking three of the last five, all of them typically do very well when the stock market is strong. And you can see uh, that each of these sectors had good years. Uh, and it, it, it's related to the important cause, the good fundraising, but also the economy. Let's look at some of the trends in giving. This is a slide that shows giving over time. And I, what I'd like to draw your attention to is that giving tends to increase almost every year. The, uh, when we're in an inflation, and you can see that with the, I don't know if that's a dark yellow uh, bar, those years giving either tends to slow in its growth or it may actually decline. Uh, you can see those three years right around 2009 during the Great Recession. Thank uh, the Lord, we're hopefully past that. Although we're in some pretty challenging times right now. You can see that uh, that drop before 2019, it was during a time when the economy was expanding. It's very unusual to see giving decline under those circumstances. And we do think that the ta that tax reform had something to do with that. Giving tends to be right around 2% of the gross domestic product, and it's at 2.1% this year, so it's very consistent uh, with historic returns. We have been able to improve 1979, 1.6%, 1 up to 2.1% in 2019, but it's been around 2% of the GDP uh, since about the year 2000 for sure. This slide shows how giving follows the S&P 500. And so the uh, S&P 500 is in the dotted black lines and they, the, the dark yellow band uh, is uh, total giving. And, and what you can see here, if you look closely, is that giving follows the S&P 500, but it's not as dramatic in its swings. And frankly, there are some delays. The reason that's important is that good fundraisers and good fundraising organizations build long-term relationships with their donors. And so uh, they can have some time when the market's strong to add new donors. And if they're good at building relationships and retaining donors, they're able to hold on to those donors even in tough times. What we find typically at Campbell & Company is that major donors tend to reduce the number of organizations they support before they reduce the amount they give to the organizations they care about most. So you always want to be targeting being a top three philanthropic priority for all of your donors. And that takes a lot of hard work in stewardship and relationship building. Uh, I want to show you that there are a, an extraordinary number of nonprofit organizations in the country today. And what that means is that uh, whatever organization you're rep representing, you're in a very competitive atmosphere. And uh, we want to encourage you to think about best practices and use them. And what might be some of those best practices today? First of all, we're in, we're in a very significant uh, pandemic crisis, and it's created an economic crisis. So what can you do to position your organization to come out of this crisis very strong? How do you keep your employees engaged if you're working remotely? How do you keep uh, people, how do you stay connected to your donors? Uh, maybe some of your, uh, maybe some of the organizations at which you work had to make significant uh, adjustments to their budget 
into their spending. And these are all things that you have to look at in order to maintain, in order to prepare for coming out of the crisis very strong. I, you know, most of the organizations we're working with that are enduring uh, deficits are looking at two, three, or four scenarios about what it may look like when the pandemic truly lifts and how they can emerge strong. Focusing, as I said, on donor earlier, donor retention and stewardship. Most organizations, this is a, a, a little known uh, fact, but most organizations, if they want to achieve their near and longer term annual giving goals, all they really have to do is increase donor retention. What that takes is good knowledge of who your new donors are and uh, using technology to direct to them very carefully, thank you. You've made the first gift ever to the Cleveland Food Bank, for instance. We really appreciate your support. Let us tell you what your gift is allowing us to do in these difficult times. In future years, say last year, you made your first ever gift to the Cleveland Food Bank. We hope that you will re repeat that gift. You might even consider increasing it. These are things that you can do in a very personalized way with uh, good use of technology. And of course, there's a lot of outreach that is very personal that you want to do as well. But focusing on retention and stewardship has never been more important than it is today. Many organizations are investing in, in, in different ways to have meaningful engagement that is virtual. I will tell you, organizations that invested in this prior to the pandemic are in a little bit better situation than those that may have started to invest after the pandemic hit. You know, our view for, for a long time, uh, especially for instance, of major gift fundraisers, many of whom are out on the road making visits all the time, the organization ought to invest in the technology that allows them to work remotely. Those organizations that did that when their employees and their fundraisers had to work from home were in a better position. So just be thinking on how you can invest in virtual engagement. I'm on the board of a major organization in Chicago, and we are having, like many of you are, a virtual event in October. And we've really taken time to think about how to do this in the best practice way. And we have not reduced our goal for the event. So using new and creative ways to engage, uh, or using technology in new and creative ways to engage and attract supporters. You know, social media has been around for a long time, but some organizations are more creative than others in using social media to their advantage. And, and it is clearly true that uh, an increasing number of donors are searching on social media before they choose to make gifts. Uh, and uh, this is especially true of emerging generations. Uh, it, you'd think it doesn't need to be said, but it is so important that you stay in touch with your donors now. And organizations we're working with have uh, been doing well-being checks. We have found that they're doing that with their major donors. And we found that since face-to-face -face visits take time, those involved in individual giving might have a little more time on their hands. And if you've done wealth screening and looked at who you think some of your prospective donors might be, this could be a good time with that downtime that major gift fundraisers or individual giving officers have to reach out and, and try to do some qualification of donors, that you, prospective donors, that you just haven't had the time to reach. It, couldn't, it could never be a more important today than to be clear about your mission and the impact that your organization wants to have. There are a lot of reasons that donors support or organizations, and some are driven by uh, tax benefits. Uh, we find that typically, although people are, uh, might be driven by tax benefits, it usually has more to do with how much they give and when they give than whether they give at all. Uh, and so, most donors are just trying to make a difference in the world. And you have to be very clear about what your mission is. And if they choose to support your organization, how their gift is going to make an impact. This is a, also an important retention tool, letting donors know the impact that their gift has made. And that we think that it's especially uh, important, it's never been more important than today to understand your organization's role in the anti-racism movement. And uh, most or all of our clients have been working on this long before George Floyd uh, was killed. 
Uh, and yet, this is a time to really increase your emphasis on how you are uh, moving toward DEIA principles and uh, creating equity and fairness in your organization. So we want to move to the panel discussion. I tried to keep this presentation as brief as possible uh, because we only have an hour this year because we're doing this virtually. So let me just start by uh, introducing our three panelists. Uh, on the far left uh, of my screen, uh, you can see Kay Rodolfi. Kay is Senior Vice President of Advancement at the Cleveland Foundation. She's responsible for all fundraising activities at the foundation, leads a staff of 18 people. They're involved in charitable gift planning, donor relations, donor communication, bringing in new donors, and donor stewardship. Kay was formerly Associate Vice President at Case Western Reserve University and Director of its $1 billion campaign. Uh, prior to that, Kay worked at Ohio State University, her undergrad alma mater, Ohio Wesleyan and the American Lung Association. Mary Levine Butler is Vice President of External Affairs at the Cleveland Food Bank. Uh, Mary uh, spent, excuse me, spent much of her career in uh, California. She's a native of Northeastern Ohio, but spent much of her career in California. She uh, had a very successful law practice or a career as a lawyer, partner in a law firm before moving to the nonprofit sector. Uh, she is responsible for fundraising, communications, and volunteer advocacy efforts at the Cleveland Food Bank. Prior, Mary served as Vice President of Development and Legal Counsel for a large nonprofit health organization in the Silicon Valley. Um, Mary has a bachelor's degree at Ohio University and a law degree as well. Eileen Saffron is founder of The Gathering Place. Uh, she founded this organization in 1995 and served as CEO until earlier this year when she started her own consulting firm. Prior to founding The Gathering Place, Eileen worked as a social, a clinical social worker for 23 years. Being touched by cancer herself, Eileen envisioned a place that would focus on the mind, body, and spirit journey of cancer. Uh, when she left the gathering place, it had a two and a half million dollar budget. It had served over 50,000 individuals, had two main locations, 21 full-time staff, and 14 contract professionals. Under Eileen's leadership, the Gathering Place raised over $35 million, relying 100% on private funding. So we really have uh, a terrific panel, and I want to thank you all uh, for joining us today. Let me see if I can get, I want to see so I can see the panelists. Let's go ahead and get started. Even, even though I said a little bit about your organization and these are very well-known organizations in Cleveland, I thought I might be able to ask each of you to say a little bit more about your organization, how it intersects with philanthropy, um, what, your, what your high level uh, view of the results are, and then you know, what's happened in the intervening six months that's made this a different world. When I look at my screen, Eileen, you're to my uh, far left, and I'm a left-to-right person, so let me ask you to go first, if that's okay. Sure, my pleasure. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate being involved with the, on this panel with my these other colleagues. So uh, we're certainly in a surreal, some surreal times. Uh, let me just first talk about the gathering place uh, that was uh, I left uh, 22 years of my life work at the end of 2019, and so I'm in a new, new normal. So the Gathering Place uh, is 100% privately funded, like you mentioned, Peter, and all of its programs and services are provided free of charge. And so there is no hard stream of monies that come in. It doesn't, uh, you know, the last point that you made, Peter, I think is very critical in terms of the anti-racism. And that is that cancer doesn't discriminate. And the uh, organization has served anyone who's had the courage to walk through the doors uh, with any kind of cancer or family member or close friend on the journey since we opened in January of 2000. And that being said, I think has been quite a marketable and remarkable 
piece of our fundraising because people understand in the greater Cleveland area that first of all, it doesn't matter if you have deep pockets or no pockets, but will you will be served. And the only way that that's possible is through the generosity of the community. And when we started it, it we seed monies came in great amounts from foundation world. However, that uh, inverted quite significantly. And now the gathering place relies big time on the wonderful generosity of individuals and families and family funds. Um, I think that it's also important to note that as an organization, uh, we really moved forward with crafting and posting a diversity and inclusion statement as soon as someone walks into either one of our facilities as well as uh, really try to educate uh, from the top down, and that is leadership holding a diversity and inclusion retreat for the organization back in 2019. So I do think that the, it is important to get the story out for people to understand that this organization, uh, albeit small in the, in the big stream of things, is very large in as much as raising over $2 million every year with an endowment, by the way, uh, when I left that was pushing $6 million um, is really is really important. And uh, I do want to say, however, for people who are listening from the greater Cleveland area, you know that there's two small little hospital systems called the Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals who raised significant funds uh, in total, but also carve out a significant amount when it comes to cancer care. And deservedly so, they do phenomenal work. However, this is why it's so critical that our fundraising efforts are, are, are heard loud and clear because all we're asking is to carve out a little bit of that money that one would put towards cancer care uh, towards an organization like ours that, again, is unique. And if we didn't exist, what we do in the greater Cleveland area wouldn't exist. So I, I uh, really uh, validate and reinforce what you've said about the importance of stewardship and individual giving. Thank you. Mary, tell us a little more about the Cleveland Food Bank. And I know that things have been very active there in recent months. Um, yes, they have been. Uh, but the Greater Cleveland Food Bank has been around um, the Cleveland area for 40 years. Last year, we celebrated our 40th anniversary. And um, we have um, over 140 employees, 21,000 volunteers. And let me tell you, the volunteers take the place of, I forget how many employees, if it was full-time equivalents. And we could not keep our doors open without them. We, have, um, we work with over 1,000 partner program agencies in six counties that we serve. We are the largest provider of emergency food in Northeast Ohio. And we, um, we enjoy, we are honored, we are humbled by the support in this community. Um, everything from individual donors, little Girl Scout troops sending us $25 because they understand the importance of kids not eating to wonderful philanthropy and support from corporations, from foundations. Um, it's, it's just unbelievable. Um, we have over the years made much more of a concerted effort to provide fresh um, produce and perishable product because we know that affects people's health. And we believe in food as medicine. Um, and we've worked with our healthcare providers throughout the city to get that through, to get that point across. And um, I will tell you, since December 2019, a lot of things have changed around here. We have completely flipped around everything we do because you can't talk to people face to face. You can't um, have people coming through your warehouse. We have um, started, we now make the newscast every Thursday night because we disrupt traffic on the shoreway because we are doing produce, we, could, we are doing distributions at the Muni lot. This community, um, all six counties, but in particular Cuyahoga County has stepped up to help us. I just, you can't even imagine um, the support that we get day in and day out. And it, you know, in some ways it amazes us and in other ways we just shake our head and go, that's Cleveland. Um, that's Greater Cleveland. Um, so we have wonderful programs. Um, this summer, we're doing our big summer feeding program. Um, you know, we usually have 90 some sites. This year, we're down quite a few sites because you can't have congregate meals and you can't do those things. So we have grab and go, grab and go food because you know, the schools closed in March 
And many of the children within our community rely on those meals, you know, reduce um, breakfast and lunch at the schools. So we've had to figure out how to feed those kids because they're no longer in school. So we have that. We have the National Guard has been helping us since March. I mean, you know, I could go on and on and on, but philanthropy, um, people giving to us um, has enabled us to provide um, meals to so many new families who have come to us. Since March, we've had over 17,000 new families who have never used a food bank before come to us. And our expenses, as you can imagine, have also gone up because we're spending on average $170,000 a week because a lot of the food um, contributions to us have kind of waned because more people are going out shopping. And, and so, um, but through, um, through donations, through um, we've gotten some wonderful help from the government, but most importantly, we've gotten the government to waive some of these crazy requirements that they had for feeding kids and feeding people that we can do more and more. So um, all in all, our programs team, our warehouse team, our truck drivers who never miss a day going out the door, our operations team was here five days a week from four in the morning till eight o'clock at night. Um, we're feeding Cleveland, and um, but we couldn't do it without philanthropy. We just could not do it without philanthropy. And I will be quiet and now let somebody else talk. But I'm, I mean, I just, I am so grateful and gracious and we are so humbled by the support that we've received. Um, we always get wonderful support, but since March, it's just been amazing. Thank you. Okay, everybody in Cleveland knows the Cleveland Foundation, but what do they need to know that you could tell them about what the foundation does and how you go about fundraising and the, and the difference that it makes in the community? Sure. So, you know, I just want to dial back to 1914 when our founder, Frederick Harris Goff, came, conceived of the notion of the Community Foundation and just remind everyone we were the first in the world. And when um, nonprofits come to us and talk to our program team about money, that money came from donors, the original donors whose funds still sit in trust. And so um, I know everyone on this call is very familiar with approaching the Cleveland Foundation and working with our, my colleagues in grant making um, on various initiatives. Um, I will say that throughout our over 106 years, equity has always been part of the Cleveland Foundation's work. And initially, you know, much more involved with studies, but through the decades, absolutely. Um, on, the, on the advancement side, we work with bringing donors into the foundation and our approach is very customized. When we're meeting with a prospective donor, our question is, what would you like to do with your philanthropy and how can we help? And so um, our donors come to us, I think in large part because of the personal relationships. Every donor has a donor relations advisor assigned to them. They come to us because they want to know more about what is going on in Cleveland and through us, they have access to the work the program team is doing and really under, understand um, how deep some issues are. And we um, are so proud to say that it's our donors, the donor advised funds in general, often more money goes out from the fund over time than went into the fund in the first place. And so it's just a hugely impactful way to, to be philanthropic. And I will say that in our donor base, over 20% have an additional bequest going to the Cleveland Foundation, which then benefits the nonprofit sector. And the vast majority of our donor advised funds leave the dollars at the end of the life to the Cleveland Foundation. So it's really impactful philanthropy. And um, I'm just proud to, to represent the foundation. Let me stay with you, Kay, for another question here. Uh, there's a significant trend among community foundations to be taking an active leadership role in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, here at where I am in Chicago, the Chicago Community Trust has created a strategic plan around trying to uh, eliminate wealth inequality. Talk about bold plans. Uh, and, and also community foundations have been rising to the challenge to respond to the pandemic. Tell us a little bit about those two things at the Cleveland Foundation. Sure. Well, on the big picture, Peter, um, racial equity has been the underpinning of all of our current initiatives. So for the past you know, decade or so, whether it's K through 12 education or work in the neighborhoods or human services or youth and development, that's been the goal. Um, I can tell you that going forward, you will see the Cleveland Foundation taking an even bolder stance and addressing the issues around um, systemic racism. And there's a strategic planning process going on at the board and senior team level right now. And there are other more immediate 
um, plans in the works that I'm not at liberty to share today, but in the very near future will be shared. But I can just tell you on other um, related issues, the Cleveland Foundation has um, hosted the African American Philanthropy Committee, founded by the late Steve Minter, since 1993. We just had our um, fifth um, summit, and virtually, of course, and this group is very active in philanthropy um, and the African American community and has become a national model. Um, I will tell you that two years ago, our entire staff went through racial equity and inclusion training and all new incoming staff goes through that as well. And that has been just really, really life-changing for all of us, I think. Um, on the COVID front, we were the original convener and funder of the COVID-19 Rapid Response Fund, which now has raised almost $9 million. And there's a funding group, anyone who could, any funder who contributes more than $50,000 is invited to sit at the table and be part of these funding decisions. Um, the Cleveland Foundation made a seven-figure commitment to this, but I will tell you our donors from their donor advised funds granted out over 775,000 from their funds to this fund. So it's really been an, a community-wide organization um, that we have been part of, and all of those dollars should be granted out um, by the end of July. So they're immediately being put to work in the community. Great stuff. Thank you. <clears throat> Eileen, uh, giving the healthcare we saw in the data went up almost 7% last year. Interested in how that does or does not reflect what happens at the, the gathering place. On, on one hand, a lot of times the, the needle is moved by very large gifts to healthcare. And you were talking about uh, uh, the gathering place being a more broad based, more modest, but impactful organization. On the other hand, I'm wondering about whether the degree to which gathering place giving is uh, reflected by grateful patients, which is also a significant trend in healthcare. Tell us a little bit about how the gathering place does or does not line up with that 6.8% increase in giving to healthcare last year. Well, Peter, first of all, I think it's important that everyone understands that the gathering place does not solicit participants. The, that's, that is the name of, of the folks who avail themselves of our programs and services. Um, okay. We do not call them patients. Um, so okay. when you talk about the grateful patient, which is something that I think hospitals have uh, really done very well in their fundraising, uh, the Gathering Place has never, ever done that. Now, that being said, there are people who you know self-identify and, and become donors. Um, we did several years ago start a, commi a, a community participant fund so that if someone had been a participant and we went back three years but were not actively participants um, presently, there was a, a, a call to action by other participants to say, hey, if you can, will you pay it forward? And so that has certainly uh, occurred and will that fund continues. But but again, I think it's important to understand that our monies are raised not by people who pretty much, um, again, uh, avail themselves of our programs and services. I think what we're going to find, and I think everyone on this call would, would agree, that giving to healthcare is going to skyrocket in 2020 because of the pandemic. I mean, I think that there are a lot of... Um, philanthropic entities, whether it's foundations or it's uh, wealthy families um, who recognize that there is a real gap in haves and have nots when it comes to health care. And this has really raised, I think, the level of awareness significantly in our country. Now, cancer doesn't go away. I mean, cancer has continued to be diagnosed all through this pandemic. And as a matter of fact, it's really our, our participants present and future who are very vulnerable. So, you know, the organization has shifted to a full virtual platform to provide its programs and services and, uh, and a shout out to the staff for doing that. So when we look at healthcare as a sector and giving in this coming year, I think what we're gonna find is a significant impact that COVID has had in the sector as a whole, uh, especially to give to hospitals and then neighborhood uh, community health centers where people are needing to go and get their care outside of, of the, you know, the, the formal medical facilities. 
Thank you. Mary, giving to human service organizations, particularly those meeting basic human needs, tend to actually rise during economic downturns. I'm aware that I think it was 2009 that up until that point, Feeding America, the umbrella organization of which Cleveland Food Bank is part of, had the, the best fundraising year it had, had ever had. Now, Giving to Human Service also did very well, going up 5%. Tell us a little bit about how well you did last year and, and, and what has happened, maybe in terms of if you have a little bit of numbers available or how giving might have spiked as a result of the pandemic with people responding to basic human need. Well, um, I think it's all relative in terms of, you know, there's a tremendous need in our community for food. Um, we have a lot of people who are hungry from children all the way through seniors. Um, and while the community is extremely generous to us, and 2019 was a good year for us, um, 2020, uh, the giving has been amazing um, because people realize and understand that um, this pandemic isn't going away soon, that this pandemic is affecting more people of color um, and, um, and other vulnerable people within our community and that they want to help out. Um, and yes, during econo hard economic times like the recession, like right now, um, people are finding a way to give and to be very generous to us because they know that the human need, one of the basic needs is eating. Um, and so they continue to, to help us out. And, and, um, and so I think that um, while you know, people are saying, oh my goodness, your, your, your fundraising is wonderful, the expenses are wonderful too. And we also have to remember that, that our needs are different. Um, our needs have changed so much within the last six to eight months um, because so many more people are out of school, out of work, um, losing their homes, um, you know, all of those things. And one of the first things they think about is how am I going to feed my family? Um, and so they're coming to us. And, and again, like I say, I will say the generosity is amazing, but we also have to remember that the people that are most vulnerable are the ones that need us most. And they have needed us all along. Um, you know, when you look at the poverty rate in the city of Cleveland with respect to children, we're like the highest in the country for large cities. Um, and, and so we have a big job to do. There are about, before the pandemic hit, there were about 550,000 people um, within our service area needing our services. And we were only reaching about 300, 350. So we still have a large number of people to, to get to, to reach out to. Um, and so we're trying very much to make sure that we work with our partner agencies so they have not only the food but also resources to help um, to help people within their community as well. Thank you. Um, Kay, I want to switch gears here a little bit and talk about donor advised funds. Uh, sure. it, it's a it's a really interesting topic to me and I hope to, to others. There's a case to be made that donor advised fund giving is transforming philanthropy in many ways. Uh, it is impacting giving to foundations. It's in cap, in cap, impacting giving to uh, public society benefit where the for-profit BAFs of the world are counted. We showed in the graph that it might be impacting the share of giving that comes directly from individuals. Um, it, it, it's, it's offered access to something like a family foundation to those with much less wealth. And yet still some people are concerned about lack of transparency uh, in donor advised fund giving and, and whether there should be uh, a minimum amount like there is with foundations that they have to give from the corpus. Tell us, tell us about the world of donor advised giving at, at, at Cleveland Foundation. And I invite you to make a case for how, how important it is. Well, okay, so I will say for donors, you know, the benefit is that when you make a contribution to your donor advised fund, you can claim an immediate tax donation now and decide later what charities to support. And that's huge. But I would say that the benefits to the nonprofit sector are even greater. So as I alluded to earlier, I think the dollars spread further by going into a donor advised fund, being well managed by an entity like the Cleveland Foundation, and the donors make their grants and over time, they end up giving out more than the fund has grown to. And I think that's just huge. And then again, I also linked it to the sticking power of, of these dollars staying and going into bequests that help indefinitely. 
um, in per perpetuity, I should say. I th think the important thing to note about a community foundation, whether it's us or any other, is that we are built on the notion that we have relationships with our donors. So we are different from the um, private sector organizations that are mostly online based. You know, every single one of our donors has a donor relations officer. Every single donor is part of the Cleveland Foundation family. They have access to all the information of what is going on throughout the city. And, you know, as far as the legislation to require a 5% payout, my concern is that that would create a ceiling instead of a floor. Our donors tend to give out 10 to 12% per year, year over year. And I will tell you that in times of crisis, I think it's even more important to have these dollars sitting in donor advised funds. And I'm just gonna read a stat. Recently, um, the Community Foundation Public Awareness Initiative surveyed 64 community foundations and found that for March and April of 2020, giving was up 58.2% compared to March and April of 2019. At the Cleveland Foundation, we found that the same giving from the donors of advice funds was 70%. So here are dollars that donors are able to rapidly distribute. And as I mentioned, 775,000 went into the COVID-19 rapid response fund, but many other dollars went out to the food bank and other organizations that are doing frontline work. And if the donors had given that money away initially, it would not be there now to meet times of crisis. So I think it's just so important um, that we differentiate between community foundation donor advised funds and the other donor advised funds. So Mary, uh, maybe some of these donor, this donor advised fund giving was going into the Cleveland Food Bank or Eileen, maybe the gathering place too. What, what advice do either of you have for fundraisers out there about how to, uh, how to seek funds from those who have donor advised funds. Do you have strategies around that at either of your organizations? Eileen, you wanna go? <laughs> well, sure. Um, I think, you know, it, it goes back to cultivating and stewarding relationships and, you know, tr and, and really doing your research, data mining and finding out who is it that has donor advised funds. Um, you know, I think that the Gathering Place has done an, an incredible job and, and really even ratcheted it up during this last four month, five month period in contacting their donors and telling the story and helping people understand, you know, what it is, where's the money going? It's not asking for money. It's telling your story of where it's going and what it's doing and what and what they've done to really turn 180 degrees. So I think it's really it's really doing uh, the due diligence of uh, that of, of really doing your in, constantly doing your environmental scan. You know who who has those donor advised funds, and uh, you know often you know stakeholders uh, from years ago would have now shifted and created donor advised funds, for instance, through the Cleveland Foundation. Um, you know, it's not uncommon that we've had donors throughout the years that all of a sudden we start getting monies from their donor advised fund. And uh, that's always, you know, that's just terrific. And, uh, you know, I think another thing is that donors talk to one another and donor advise, advisors talk with one another. And when you know that someone's interested in a mission, uh, it's nice that the donor advisors are able to educate their donors about something that might be of interest to them. And so I think it's all about relationships. It's relationships with the advisors and it's relationships with the donors. Sure. I can't say anything more than that, except that we, are, we, we have a wonderful relationship with the Cleveland Foundation. We have an amazing gift officer who works with us. We work with many of our donors have donor advised funds there. Um, but I think something that you said earlier, Peter and Eileen, is so true in that you have to know your donor. You have to be able to know your donor to understand at, at what they need, what they want, what they want to do. And telling your story and making sure that the story resonates with them is really critical. This past six months or so, um, four months, I, I mean, time seems to be flying by, but we have found so many more donors want to do monthly giving. And they do monthly giving in a variety of different ways. But for us, that is an amazing thing because then we know we have consistent dollars. We know what's coming in the door. 
And so we have been able to talk to all of the new monthly donors that we have um, that have come in the door since COVID started. And it's an amazing number, but also the stories that, and the whys, why they want to give to us, why they, they are looking to us. And they love the fact that we're efficient. They love the fact that we're transparent. They love the fact that they see their dollars staying in their community. Um, and so all of that is truly important. And, and we see more and more gifts coming through donor advice funds. But we also see that that donor advice fund or not, if you're not talking to your donors, if you're not getting to know them, if you're not understanding the, the reasons why and how they can help in learning their story, it doesn't matter where the money's coming from because it's not going to come in the door anymore unless you unless you really make that effort to get to know your donors and that is absolutely critical for us and i've got a wonderful story as people probably know we do um every thursday we do a huge food distribution at the muni lot downtown and thousands thousands of people come through thousands of cars come through um and there was a fellow who was driving down the muni lot and he pulled over on the shoulder and he is watching this and he was like, he was trying to figure out what the heck was going on. And then all of a sudden it, he started remembering. So he had never been to the food bank before. So he continued down the shore. He pulled into our driveway and he was just absolutely amazed. Gave us an amazing gift, first time ever. But he said, people have to see this. People have to see what is happening in their community. And we have talked to him since and really helped to understand why why he pulled over on that side of the road and why he stopped in the door and 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 what he wants to now do because it's just so important um to to him to his family he's getting his kids to come and so you know it's it's that talking and and we are lucky that that we have so many people who help us like the cleveland foundation i mean they we feel they're our partner they are our partner um, and when we've got a need or a concern or something, we call our donor officer. We talk to them all the time. And we talk to so many people in our community all the time. We have to listen. And, and I think so many times people don't listen. We have to listen every hour that we're open. We have to listen to our donors. We have to more listen to our clients than the people we're serving. Um, some of the stories that um, they would, would break your heart. Not too long ago, we had one of our... Um, um, donors who give us food and they gave us flowers to give away at the produce distribution at the distribution and one lady emailed us that night and she said I turned around and I saw the vase of flowers on the table and I just cried because you brought something beautiful into my life in addition to the beautiful fresh fruits and vegetables so listening to that story um, is really special and and if we don't then take that story and share it with others then we're not doing our job and if I could just add to this, um, Please. just say that our our donor relations advisors have taken the opportunity to, in this remote world to reach out to every single donor that we work with. So that's their, been their project for May and June. And they had already been very actively reaching out, which may be why we saw an uptick of 70% of gifts at this time. But we also pulled together a session about how to give impactfully to um the human services organizations, but also the arts organizations you care about who can't fill seats anymore or can't get people to pay ticket admission. So, I mean, it's that kind of work, I think, that you underscore so well, the need to just be in constant contact with your donors during this crisis. So I might surmise from all this that they're not donor advised fund holders, they're people. They're people. Yes. They're yes. very wonderful people. <laughs> yes. And Cleveland, so amazing community and i lived in silicon valley and i will tell you cleveland people there are no more generous people than the people in cleveland you're, you're projecting right into my next question I'm Mary, sorry. which <laughs> is you know this is this is national data and you know we find that sometimes people feel like it aligns closely with what's happening in the community sometimes it doesn't what's special about cleveland as a donor community and i'll just throw that out to anybody that wants to uh, take the answer. Um, I'm going, there was a, um, everybody probably knows who Connie Schultz is and she writes so well. And I remember hearing her say that uh, about people in Cleveland. She said, they're the most generous people you'll ever meet. If somebody had two nickels and you needed one, they'd give it to you. And that may sound like a simple story, but it is so true. People in this community 
care so much about each other. We're not the richest community in the world when it comes to dollars necessarily, but when it comes to giving and, and their hearts, we second to none, second to none. And I think that we all of us see that day in and day out um, and, and they just want to know what they can do to help. And I would just I, add, I, go ahead, Kay. If you look at the Cleveland Foundation, you know, we're the oldest, but that was from a time when Cleveland was the fifth largest city. We are still in the top five or six in terms of assets under management across the country. And that just speaks to the ongoing generosity of Clevelanders because our, the ones who are ahead of us are much larger and much more rapidly growing cities and areas, including Silicon Valley. I think it also speaks to the, the the culture of giving, the longevity and the culture of giving and the rootedness of people. Um, you know, sometimes people say, you know, that's a plus, that's a minus, but but there's people who have lived in the greater Cleveland area for year, families for years and years and years and generations. And generational giving is strong in in the greater Cleveland area. And all of, and we are grateful for the nonprofits that exist here because of that. And people understand how important it is to, to give through the, it, because it's a, it's a learned behavior. And uh, I think that that is something special about Cleveland. You guys are making me miss home. Um, so we've got three minutes and I'd like to ask each of you to take just a little under a minute to say what, what, what advice do you have for fundraisers working in these really tumultuous times? And uh, Kay, can I start with you, please? Sure. Well, you know, I think it's all about stewardship and, you know, we've been saying that all along, but whenever times are rough, I think that's when you need to double down with your current donors and work with them and thank them. And, you know, I've also looked at a study that talks about will giving go up or will giving go down? And I think um, generationally, it's the study pointed out that the baby boomers really said they don't have enough information, whereas the millennials felt like they did have more information. So I think it's, again, putting out your story and making people understand what your organization is doing at this pivotal time. Great, thank you. Mary? Um, I would say too that it's connecting all the dots um, we talk about our donors, but our volunteers. Um, what about our what are about our partner agencies? What about our clients who come to us um, and and give to us so much in terms of maybe not dollars, but in terms of just the warmth and the humanness and the kindness. So I, I would say to anybody in philanthropy, connect the dots because every single person that comes across, comes through your life is is a supporter in a different way. Mm -hmm. Eileen, you get the last well, word I don't, here. I don't know that I have any words of wisdom to add to what Kay and Mary have said, but I think that we all need to really embrace hope. Um, I think that many of us, through the effects of this pandemic and what's the crisis that's going on, uh, testing our moral compass as a society, uh, has really uh, caused us to can kind of be back on our heels a little bit. We have to get back to really embracing our missions and really understand helping people understand the good work that we all do in this community. Every single organization is well worth supporting. And whether the dollars go to the food bank or they go to the gathering place, um, whether the Cleveland Foundation is supporting this one or that one, it is hopeful that this community will continue to thrive and survive through the philanthropy that does exist. And, and I just, I, I want to do that message of hope for everybody. It's a great way to finish. Uh, I, this has been a wonderful discussion. I want to thank all three of you for participating. Uh, I hope that those who uh, signed up to join us today found both the data and the dialogue uh, to be helpful. And Matt, am I turning it over to you again, or am I just signing us all off here? Please let me know. You could, but I am just going to say thank you to everybody and say goodbye. So thank you, Peter. Thank you, our <laughs> panelists. And thank you, everyone who joined us. Thank you. Thanks all. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone.